Hi folks, we've still got uh, some more to do. My website's Jason Burns uh, Preacher .com. and uh, my you got my Facebook and my Twitter. And uh, so we looked at Romans uh, chapter six, and um, we looked at what Romans chapter six says, and. It seemed on the surface, when we looked at Romans 6, that death meant just physical death. But as we looked at Romans 5, um, we began to see that there was more to just the... It was physical death, as in the annihilationist idea, but there was a, a spiritual aspect to, to uh, death. Um, and we looked at that. Uh, I tried to look at this commentary and get some material from that, but I didn't. I wasn't able to get anything. I was a bit disappointed in that. But there was nothing in that commentary that would go against uh, the traditional view of the doctrine of hell or anything. Uh, but we had to be fair that as we looked at the surface aspect of Romans six, it seemed as if that the annihilationists had a point. But when we went further back and read Romans five. It kind of put things in perspective and undermined the annihilationist position. Uh, and then when we looked at further afield of Paul's epistle, like to Ephesians, it definitely undermined uh, the annihilationist position. So now, uh, before we get into the next part of this video, um, I want to go to uh, this commentary, uh, Matthew Poole, a Puritan commentator, and I want to go to Romans 6, Romans 6, verse 23, I'll see what he has to say. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord. So he has some links to scripture here. So let's go to Genesis 2 17. Two seventeen it says, uh, But of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou shalt eat us thereof, thou shalt die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the men should be alone. I will make them a help meet for him. So it says here, The moment they eat of the tree that they shouldn't eat, that they will die. Now they ate the tree. They ate from, from the knowledge of good and evil. And at that moment they did not die, but he said they would die. So that means it was a spiritual death. Not just a physical death. Okay. Um... So we go to uh, 1 Peter 1 4. I don't know what that These are cross references in the commentary. 1 Peter 1 4 to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fit another way reserved in heaven for you. So that, that's just showing that we get eternal life. Okay. So let's see what, we, well, so what Poole says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now therefore compare the office of both these services together and you shall easily see which master is best to serve and obey. The wages of sin will pay you in the end is death, but the reward that God will freely bestow upon you if you have, if you be a servant is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Wages, the word properly signifies victuals. The Romans of all paid their soldiers with provision of victuals in recompense of their service. Afterwards they gave them the money, but still the old term was retained. And now it is used to signify any reward or stipend whatsoever. It is death. By death, here we must understand not only temporal. This is Matthew Poole, one of the great commentators of all time, yeah? It is death by death. We must understand not only temporal, but also a more especially eternal death. As appears by the opposition it hath to eternal life. This is the just and the true 
hide of sin. The gift of God is eternal life. He doth not say that eternal life is the wages of righteousness, but that it is the gracious free gift of God. He varies the phrase on purpose to show that we attain not eternal life by our own merits or our own works or worthiness, but by the gift of grace of God, for which cause he also added through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here, an expert in Hebrew and Greek, Matthew Poole, sees the traditional view of hell in that passage and not just annihilationism. So, the next one we want to look at, I think, um, is, uh, if I can get it, is Luke 16. Therefore was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple, fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar, named Lazarus, who was laid at his gate full of souls, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his souls. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And he in, in hell he left, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in the bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in the flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from the hence to you cannot, neither can they pass towards that would come to thee. Then he said, I pray therefore, thee therefore father that thou should send him to my father's house for i have five children five brethren that he may testify unto them lest they also come into the place of torment and abraham said unto him they have moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said nay father abraham but if thou went unto them from the dead they will repent and he said unto them if they hear not moses and the prophets neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead so let's go to Matthew Poole, who is an expert on Greek, and we'll go to Luke chapter 16 in Poole. Luke 16, verse 19. So, this is what uh, he has to say. It is a question of no great concern for us to be resolved <coughs> about whether this is history or a narrative or a matter of fact or a parable. That those contend on either side are probable arguments for their opinion and it may be they best judge who determine it by neither the one nor the other. But a profitable discourse that hath in it something of both, our chief concern is to consider what our Lord by design instructed us. And certainly those do not judge amiss who think that the discourse had a great reference to what went before, where our Saviour had been exhorting his hearers to make themselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, as also to the Pharisees deriding him for his doctrine. Our Lord by this doctrine letting them know that the danger of covetousness and uncharitableness, and also letting them know that what is highly esteemed among men may be abomination in the sight of God, he telleth them there was a rich man who lived in great plenty and splendour. His clothing was purple and fine linen, that is exceedingly costly and splendid. His fare or diet was de delicate and sumptuous, and that every day from whence may easily be concluded that if he had a heart thereunto he might have spurred something for the poor. Nor were the beggar named Lazarus poor enough, for he was full of souls and would have been glad of the offer of the rich, offer of the rich man's table. But the dogs were more charitable to, than their master, and we read of nothing which the rich man gave him, but the dogs came and licked his sores. 
What was the end of this? The beggar died and he was by the angels carried into the bosom of Abraham that is into heaven. Some will have the phrase signify one of the chiefest mansions in heaven. Abraham was the father of believers and a hospitable person while he lived upon the earth. Lazarus is expressed to have been conveyed to him. There are many things discoursed by men of wit and learning about his, Abraham's bosom. But the best centre here that by it meant heaven and from hence two great points are proved that the soul is capable of an existence separated from the body, and there is not, as some atheists dream, a mere affection of that, an accident, but a distinct spiritual subsistence, that the souls of the good, which they depart from their bodies, immediately pass into eternal state of blessedness. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of the finger And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The world had been filled with disputes about the true significance of the word which is here translated hell. The most probably true notion of it is that it signifies the state of the dead, both of the dead body and also it often signifies the grave and of the departed soul. A very learned man said that if he mistaketh not, this is the only text in scripture in which by it understood the place of torments. The Hebrew word which is translated by this far more often signifies the place of the blessed, whether the saints and patriarchs when they died, that the place wherein sinners went. Verse 24 makes it appear that here it signifies hell, properly so called as imported place of the damned. We must understand our Saviour in this hall to speak to us figuratively, that by things which we understand we might comprehend spiritual things. Heaven and hell are not too great a distance from souls in each to discourse one with the other. Neither have souls any eyes to lift up. We are by this taught that as the souls of good men, when they leave their abodes, go into a state of eternal bliss, where Abraham, Isaac and Jacob enjoy a felicity which we are not able to express, but is set out to us under the notion of Abraham's bosom to let us know that it is a place of rest and communion with the saints the same felicity with Abraham the friend of God doth enjoy so the souls of wicked men when they leave their bodies shall go into a place of torment the garments of which being such are not able to conceive they are expressed to us under the notion of being tormented by fire that it will be a great part of the misery of the damned souls to understand those to be in a state of happiness whom they in this life have scorned, despised and abused, and it may be have been instruments to hasten them to those blessed mansions. That there will come a time when the proudest sinners will be glad of help of the meanest saints if they could obtain it. Father Abraham said the rich man, send Lazarus, that Lazarus when I live suffer to lie at my gate, full of sores and would not relieve that the state of the damned will be void of the least degrees of comfort and satisfaction. The rich man desireth but a cooling of the tongue, with not so much as water as could be brought upon the tip of Lazarus' finger. finger. That the tongue is a member of abuse which will in another life lie very heavy upon lost souls. That's only a small portion of what Poole says. But Poole says, whichever way you take it, whether it be a parable or a literal history, He's still teaching eternal damnation, eternal hell, eternal torment. So, we're coming near the end now. Um, and I want to wrap up with a few things. Uh, Fudge, Edward Fudge and this other guy uh, claim to be evangelical. But these annihilationists have different views on key doctrine so like um, one annihilationist believes in soul sleep that when people die that's it their soul and body are dead so you find that these annihilationists will say that they're orthodox and dot but little things creep in things have cre crept in and each one of these annihilationists do have quirky doctrines so they're not as evangelical generally as they make out to be anyway so you have to be aware of that. So Chris Date believes in soul sleep, you know. 
Um, yeah, so. So, uh, Paul's doctrine of hell. Um, some key passages are Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and 10. Uh, if you look at Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and 10. Romans 2, verse 6 and 10. says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patience continue in well-doing, for glory and honour and immortality and life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey the unrighteous indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So there is not annihilation, there is a continual torment. Um, Paul talks about men's mortis will be judged in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3 and 5. That man's work will be judged in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. And that we're to build on Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 and 11 I think it is. Uh, return to 2 Corinthians 4.2. says but I've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty and walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God so Paul is saying there that he's done everything right he's not hid anything from anybody so um, yeah so we looked at it before in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 9. People are pushed out of the presence of God. Um, an article on hell by Christopher Townsend um, called Hell a Difficult Doctrine um, by Christopher Townsend just shows us the seriousness of the situation that sin is very seriousness and people have a problem with God concerning hell because they say oh well uh, it's not fair but if you look at Matthew 12 32 Matthew 12 32 Uh, it says, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither the world to come. So here, he's teaching that sin is very, very, very serious. More serious than we could even be forgiven, can, can even imagine. If you turn to Revelation 14.10. Uh, Revelation 14.10. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out of without mixture into the cup of the indignation, and he shall torment with fire and brimstone in the presence of the only angels in the presence of the Lamb. So there is the wrath of God and the fire of God and torment. And a modern man doesn't like this idea of the wrath of God. Man likes the love of God, but he doesn't like the wrath of God. And we have to get in our mind that when God punishes, it's just because he sees sin as very very serious but we don't see it that way um, Townsend says that the early church believed in the doctrine of hell um, it's interesting when you look at annihilationism uh, in People like Aristotle, Epicurus, Bertrand Russell, people who didn't believe, don't believe uh, in, in a, a true, true God. Or, 
uh, are often annihilationist. Um, if you look at Matthew 23, 1 to 24, verse 44, Matthew 24, 45, 51, Matthew 25, uh, verse 1 to 13, and 14 to 30, and Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, all teach about hell. Again, Jesus sees sin, the Lord sees sin as serious. If you turn to Matthew 7.13, just counteracting this modern idea that hell is unjust, Matthew 7.13 says, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which Go in therein, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few therein that find it. So there is showing that few will find it. Then if you go Matthew 5.28, says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay, so here a sin is devastating. God sees it much more seriously than we do in our modern age. Um, you can go to Mark 9, 42. Mark 9, 42. Says, That whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and were cast into the sea. And if, any, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter life maimed than living two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. So, in other words, if you sin, it's so seriously serious, you know. And um, you could look at Luke 12, 45, 48. Let's go to Luke 12, 45, 48. Luke 12, 45 to 48. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh he knocketh they open unto him. Blessed are the servants, and the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. For I say unto you that he shall gird himself, and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve him. And he shall come in the second watch, and come in the third watch, and find them so pleased are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the chief would come, he would watch and not have suff suffered his house to be broken through. But ye therefore be ready, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So all I'm saying here is it's just saying, look, it's seriousness. When the Lord comes back, there's going to be this great judgment. And you've got to take it seriously. Okay. So fire and flames and burning is in Matthew 5, 22, Matthew 7, 19, Matthew 13, 40, Matthew 18, 8, 9, Matthew 25, 41, Mark 9, 43, Luke 16, 24, John 15, 6, Matthew 3, 10, 11 and 12, Luke 3, 9, 16, 17. Fire flames burning why does god use these things about hell he's showing you how serious it is it's not just about the annihilation he said the fire and gnashing of teeth it means well you're just kind of like um you're about to be annihilated you gnash your teeth and, and there's fire and there's burning but why is it continual why is the burning continual why is the fire continual 
it's showing you that it's continual judgment. The word Gehenna for hell uh, would have the idea of a rubbish dump, but it's a place. If you're annihilated, there's no place, you're just annihilated. But here it's saying, no, there's a place where you go. Matthew 2, uh, Matthew, Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 18, 9, etc. The fire is unquenchable. Mark 9, 43. Matthew 3, 12. Luke 3, 17. Mark 9, 49. Why would Jesus use these words that fire is unquenchable? If it just meant annihilationism. So we've come to the end. Um, I think. I'm going to bring my final uh, point to bear. Um, in this series of uh, videos I've looked at. Fudge, Edward Fudge, and one or two other annihilationists. Fudge is the main scholar, the main proper academic scholar. We've looked at the Old Testament, the way they look at it. We've looked at some of the key passages uh, in John and Matthew. And we've looked at detailed uh, exegesis of them. We've looked at uh, Romans and the background to Romans theology about death. And then we've looked at uh, Lazarus and the issue of Lazarus. And then we've looked at a few other issues about the seriousness of sin and why there's a hell. Counteracting this idea that God is unjust. We think God is unjust because we don't know how sinfulness sin is. God takes sin seriously. Modern man doesn't take sin seriously. Uh, so we've basically uh, come to the end. Um, a PhD that I read by Sean uh, Bawoliski, uh, PhD 2012, on the issue of conditional immortality. Um, Sean Bawoliski, PhD 2012, is the main source that I got information, he doesn't agree fully with traditional view of hell, but he gave me some very helpful resources in his PhD uh, to be able to uh, critique uh, Dr. Fudge. Uh, in his PhD, page 29, he says, It is not too much to say that the Church Fathers presented the, in the history of Christian thought in the breadth of numbers and statues of thinkers has been characterised by the doctrine of hell. So he's saying from his research that the early church fathers taught hell. And he questions Fudge's using the early church fathers. And you've got to be careful when the, the, the uh, church, uh, when these scholars begin to use the early church and say that it, they taught hell, uh, taught annihilationism. It's not true. He notes that it's possible that Ignatius might be used for their position and it's possible Justin Martyr. Uh, but he says that, and it's true, that the early church fathers generally believed in hell. 95% of them definitely believed in 553 AD. Um, annihilationism was condemned by the Second Council of Constantinople. Um, in the 17th century, annihilationism re, 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 returned by through Socinianism. Socinianism is a heretical teaching. Here's a point that he quotes, uh, this PhD quotes uh, a Christopher Morgan, he says, Most deafening, endless punishments, most defending endless punishment have failed to recognise that the arguments produced by the annihilationists 
In contemporary evangelicalism are primarily theological in nature. What that means is when the annihilationists have been in debates with evangelicals, the evangelical scholars are not, have not been quick to realise that there's a theological agenda going on. The annihilationists will deny it, they say they're going to the Bible. But actually they have a theological agenda. Okay, and we're going to get onto that in a minute. So they're not as objective as they claim to be. So let's uh, the annihilationist talk about uh, they believe in annihilationism but a lot of modern annihilationists who are not scholars don't like the idea of the wrath of God but even an annihilationist by, like John Wayneham says fundamental to the Bible from cover to cover is the notion that God not only uh, not only deters but he also punishes so John Wayneham an annihilationist agrees that God is a God of wrath and punishes whereas a lot of annihilationists on the ground in the churches don't like the idea of penal substitution and so what will happen is those scholars who are, who are bringing in annihilationism say they believe in penal substitution i.e. that Christ was punished for their sin but on the ground your average annihilationist in the church who doesn't believe in, 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 in hell doesn't believe in a, in a God of wrath, doesn't believe Christ was punished for their sin. But yet the scholars, the annihilationist scholars, say they do. But it will only be a matter of time before these scholars abandon penal substitution. Uh, hell is punishment. Mark chapter 9, verse 42, 48, Luke 16, 19, 31, John 3, 36, Romans 2, 5 to 8, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27, 31, 2 Peter 2, 4 to 17, and Jude 13 to 23, all show that, sin, uh, that hell is punishment, that there is punishment. And a lot of annihilationists and modern Christians today don't like the idea that God is a God of punishment. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, etc. God's a God of vengeance, he will take vengeance, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6 to 8. Uh, vengeance is God's, Romans 12, 9, Deuteronomy 32, 35, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 30, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. Hell is according to the merit and degree of your guilt, Matthew chapter 11 verse 21, 24, Matthew 19, 28, 30, Matthew 25, 31, 46. Luke 12, 47, 48, John 28, John 5, 28, Romans 2, 5 and 11, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Revelations 20, 12. In other words, there's degrees of guilt. You know, the idea that we're just annihilated is contradicted by these passages that say that there's degrees of guilt in the punishment. So that's the PhD and one final issue concerning this and then we'll finish is that the annihilationists don't want to talk about Christology okay I'm going to wrap up I'm going to finish here and then I've got one last video uh, I'm going to finish everything then the annihilationists don't want to talk about Christology and the effects of annihilationism on the rest of theology so what is the effects of the rest of theology? Um, well, if annihilationism is correct, it changes the doctrine of the deity of Christ. The deity of Christ, two natures in one, the Chalcedon view. Two natures in one. If Christ was annihilated, was it the human annihilated or was it the divine? If it was the human, then it would be separated from the divine. If the divine was annihilated, it means, how can God be annihilated? God is God. So it can't mean God was annihilated. At the same time, 
It can't be that the man was annihilated because if the man was annihilated, it would be separate from the God part of Jesus. So annihilation affects the doctrine of Christ and brings in heretical teaching uh, about, about who Jesus is. Now the annihilationist in debates and in scholarly discussion have not dealt with this issue, but when they do are challenged by it, they get the they they come across like this. They'll say, "Oh well, it's a mystery. We don't fully understand," or they will say, "Well, we don't know. You know, it's it's it, 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 we're agnostic. We don't really know." But the, but but that's because there's a logical contradiction within the system, and they don't want to admit it, which proves that annihilation is totally wrong. If you believe in annihilationism, when Christ died, he was annihilated. Was it the God-man or was it the human man? If it was the human, then he was separated from the Godhood, which means he wasn't the deity of Christ. If it was the God part of Jesus that was annihilated, it means God was annihilated. Well, who was looking after the universe? So as we see, it causes Christological problems and destroys uh, Chalcedon Christology. Okay, so we've finished now, um, and I'm going to wrap up with a final uh, conclusion, a final video.